Uh, all right, uh, so it is uh, my pleasure to uh, welcome you all to our uh, our the last of the interdisciplinary conferences prior to spring break. So next week is spring break, so there will not be a noon conference, but the following week, uh, the following week there will be, um, I'll be giving the talk. Uh, so um, it's my pleasure um, to uh, introduce uh, Michael Rossi, who is an assist associate professor of the history of medicine at the University of Chicago and a faculty member of the McLean Center. He received his AB from Columbia University and a PhD in the history and anthropology of science, technology, and society from MIT. Uh, Dr. Rossi is an historian of medicine and science in the United States from the 19th century to the present. His work focuses on the historical and cultural metaphysics of the body, how different people at different times understood questions of beauty, truth, falsehood, pain, pleasure, goodness, and reality vis-a-vis -vis their corporeal selves and those of others. So really, I think, um, very, very interesting set of topics. Um, I do think one of the absolute uh, great things about the McLean Center is the interdisciplinary nature of our conversations and to have people like Professor Rossi coming on a regular basis to case conference and engaging in discussions with us is really fantastic. So. Uh, join me in welcoming Professor Rossi. Thank you. Thanks. Um, thanks for that introduction. And, um, and thank you all for coming today. Um, so today I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about, um, well, as, the, as you can see up here, oh, wait a minute. I think that these might not be the correct slides. What? They're not the correct slides. I, yeah. I, is it? Oh, shoot. Uh-oh. Um, can we recalibrate real fast? And can I send you something that's, uh, okay. I was doing this in haste. Sorry, let's let's take this one more time. Sure. You sure that that's the, let me see. I don't know. Okay, I was working too fast. Uh, we can do this fast though, right? Okay, great. Oh, let me just resend. Yes, all right. Sorry, everyone. Okay. You know what? I don't. Right. Let's just do it with the, yeah, uh, let's just do it with these. I don't know what happened to it? I'm like, Thanks. Let's let's do this again. So these are um, somehow I managed to lose the actual slides. So these are going to be draft slides. So you'll see um, there will be some um, uh, placeholder information that I'll that I'll talk us through. Um, so 
<laughs> thank you for your indulgence. Um, so, as I said, so I'm, I am still going to be talking about uh, aesthetics and uh, clinical ethics. Um, and I changed the title slightly from, from an introduction because actually this is more like some preliminary thoughts. Um, this work combines uh, some of my uh, older work of, into you know, the um, history of the body and sort of how we uh, see and feel and think about the body um, and some much newer work. So um, it's really kind of an introduction to, uh, for me as well as, uh, as, well as uh, perhaps for you. And so uh, one thing I'm very interested in, uh, in doing here, if you would, uh, if you'd indulge me, is um, I'd like to stress test this work some. So if you can, um, you know, um, we could really put it through the ringer. That would be that would be helpful. Um, and so what I'd like to do today is I'd like to proceed in five parts. Um, so uh, first, I'd like to provide a little bit of uh, oops, there we go. Yeah. So first, I'd like to provide a little bit of uh, of an introduction, right? So in this introductory part, I want to maybe define a few terms, uh, maybe set a few principles. Um, I want to give you a warrant. So like why why we should think about this at all, um, and also I'd provide some some background uh, for this question. That's that's going to be specific to uh, specific to us uh, and to the work we do at the McLean Center in particular. Um, so that'll be the introductory part. Um, then I'll just take you through methods uh, very quickly. So, uh, and again, just discuss a couple of different ways of approaching this problem, um, not exhaustively, but just to give you a sense of where I'm coming from and we can go, we can get as granular uh, on that as we want to. Um, and then uh, let's see, uh, then I will provide a historical case study. So we'll look at sort of a, uh, the ways in which aesthetics and clinical ethics have changed over the course of about like a hundred years. So say from about 1850 to 1950 with a little wiggle room on either side. Um, and then finally, I'd like to uh, offer some other points for discussion and maybe some conclusions and questions. Um, and also, do we know what's the, what's the usual policy here? We do questions as we, questions as we go, questions at the end. Great. So let's do let's do questions as we go. Um, and one thing I would ask is just because I'm uh, I might have to take my glasses off in order to see my notes, and that means that you're all blurry. So if you if you have a question, either uh, either feel free to yell or like I have sort of like reptile vision. So I, if you move, I'll I'll see you. Um, uh, but yeah, so uh, if you can be ostentatious, that would be uh, helpful. Um, Okay, so let's just get into the sort of uh, basic principles. So, you know, at first glance, um, the question of uh, you know, so this this question of uh, what is ethics or what are ethics and what are aesthetics um, might seem to be ethics and aesthetics might seem to be parallel endeavors, right? Uh, you know, they might be seen might seem to be moving in kind of similar directions, but um, but never really crossing. So, you know, a kind of rough rough and ready definition of of uh, ethics. Might be something like principles that govern behavior, right? Or uh, standards of right and wrong. Um, and there's different ways you can sort of cut morality and ethics, right? So, um, you know, one thing I think we could think about for the purpose of um, uh, for the purpose of, of our work in this talk is that, um, in many ways, you know, I would I would argue that in many ways, ethical principles guide our actions, guide even the most mundane of our actions, right? There's some sort of um, ethical principle underlying it. Um, and yet ethics, as we know from uh, case conference, uh, you know, ethical principles really only uh, tend to rise to the surface in moments of conflict, right? And, sort of, uh, and so this is when we become aware that, um, uh, that there is a uh, ethical course of action. Um, aesthetics, meanwhile, we usually think of as dealing with uh, principles of beauty and taste, right? So like what is, um, I don't know, what is, what is beautiful or um, uh, what kinds of, uh, what particular kinds of cultural forms are um, desirable at particular moments. Um, and, you know, and we, we might also, but I, I, we might also think about aesthetics as uh, dealing more broadly with just questions of, questions of sensation in general. So the word aesthetic is uh, derived from, from the, the word aesthesis, which just means sensation, right? So uh, you might think about aesthetics as the study of, of sensations. Um, or you know, uh, sensual qualities, or even maybe you know the study of, of, of reaching very broadly the study of empirical uh, sense data, um, and so again, so there's one way of thinking about this where we can think of uh, you know ethics as being about actions, whereas aesthetics are about feelings, and you know they're kind of similar, but they they work uh, they never come to cross. Um, but as many philosophers uh, have pointed out, uh, as many philosophers um, and also an occasional artist and the occasional physician have pointed out. 
Um, in reality, it's, it's often not so different, uh, not so easy to differentiate the two. Um, and so we could see uh, we could see the conflation of aesthetics and ethics um, in some of the earliest days of clinical medicine. Uh, and so this is a, a quote from uh, the physician Claude Bernard from 1865. Uh, and so Bernard is one of these sort of founders of clinical medicine. So he's uh, the uh, considered you know, the quote unquote father of physiology, right? One of the first people to think. Uh, to think uh, analytically about the chemical processes that go on in living creatures. Um, and very often he'd study these chemical processes by, um, by vivisection. So he'd, you know, you'd just cut open a live animal and sort of see how its, how its parts worked. Um, and so what Bernard said about the work of the physiologist, uh, and I'll read this to you here, he said, the physiologist is no ordinary man. He's a learned man, a man possessed and absorbed by a scientific idea. He does not hear the animal's cries of pain. He's blind to the blood that flows. He sees nothing but his idea and organisms which conceal from him the secrets he has resolved to discover. Um, and so in other words, for Claude Bernard and for his students, um, you know, at the founding of physiology, at, the, at this founding moment of uh, what would become recognizable as modern medicine, um, we see that there's a need to ignore pain. Right? So we need to ignore pain, ignore unpleasant sounds, uh, unpleasant sights, in order to get at the truth. And so here we see a kind of aesthetic consideration tied up in an ethical consideration, right? So, um, and the, the prescription for behavior, how ought, a, uh, how ought a good physiologist act? Well, a good physiologist ought to sort of take pains to block out uh, aesthetic qualities that might be other, otherwise distracting. Um, and I should note here, by the way, as far as ethics go, um, and as far as uh, examples of conflict go, um, Bernard was not a, uh, 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 Bernard was not unanimously accepted as uh, thinking that a, a good physiologist should uh, ignore the cries of animals. Uh, in fact, his uh, his wife and his daughter both came to despise him and uh, founded the first animal rights movements in Europe. So, um, again, as far as aesthetics and and ethics go, uh, it's kind of a it's a, a good object lesson in some ways. Um, and we might look at other, uh, there's other kinds of uh, ways of thinking about this. So um, again, this is uh, the Schoenberg quote is from 1946. Uh, so again, other people who commented on the fusion of ethics and aesthetics. So, uh, oh, it's also should be, that should be Arnold Schoenberg, not Arthur. Um, but uh, so Schoenberg says that music arises not from I may, but I must, right? So authentic music is an ethical imperative, he thinks, not an aesthetic one. Um, the poet Joseph Brodsky in his, uh, I believe this is from his 1988 Nobel Prize speech, um, says that aesthetics is the mother of ethics. Um, and philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein, uh, probably most thoroughly of, of all these people, really explored the, the fusion of ethics and aesthetics. Um, one of his earlier remarks about this, though, is that aesthetics and ethics are one. Um, let's see. So, um, and so I think what the important thing is that what all these people uh, and others uh, mean when they discuss ethics and aesthetics in this way um, is that is that um, sensations or aesthesis, right, uh, are some of the first ways that we interact with and identify moral values, which are the basis, basis of ethical actions, right? Um, so in other words, we might think of ethics as existing sort of you know, uh, up here in the music of the spheres, uh, but what someone like, uh, uh, certainly someone like Wittgenstein would want us to know is that ethics are sensational first, right? This is how we identify um, how we identify something as being either an ethical principle or an ethical conundrum. Um, and in fact, I would say that uh, we have this, we see this a lot in case conference uh, without, I think um, I'll have to say this without going to specifics, right? Like, uh, so many times in, uh, in our own case conferences, you know, uh, we know that ethical, con uh, that ethics consults are often triggered, triggered by moral distress. Right, and so moral distress is is a feeling, right? It's um, it's a feeling attached to a, a, an intellectual principle, but uh, the distress part is a matter of uh, sensation, um, and uh, for that matter, you know, we often, uh, more often than not, uh, the consults involve um, matters of miscommunication or or mistrust, right? And so, not necessarily ethical conundrums as ethical conundrums, right? But matters of feeling. How, how are people interacting with one another? Um, and indeed, for that matter, we also think about, um, you know, uh, oftentimes uh, they might involve, uh, say, patients behaving in ways that, um, while they might not be physically dangerous, are nevertheless, uh, you know, um, unpleasant or perhaps hateful in the, in the words of uh, the essay about the hateful patient. Um, and so at root, what I want to point out is that at root, these sorts of cases are, are feelings as much as, um, 
as considerations of actions or principles, right? And so that's the sort of the first, the first layer, uh, Wittgenstein would say something like the first layer of ethics is in fact aesthetics or sensation feeling. Okay. Um, so um, more generally though, and this, is, this will put us on, I think of even more solid footing, um, more generally uh, as Wittgenstein put it, um, and this is this is one of the reasons he's a little bit of an outlier in the way that he thinks about this. But um, more generally, he said that um, ethics and aesthetics both involve, and I'm, I'll quote him directly here: "quote the inquiry into the meaning of life or into what makes life worth living." Right. Um, and so, uh, and I like this turn of phrase because um, it points to the salience of uh, of aesthetics for clinical medical ethics. Right. Um, you know, we often speak about. Um, or consider medicine as being in the business of preserving human, human lives. Um, but of course, what I think we often mean is that uh, the, one of the core concerns of medicine is, is making life worth living, right? Um, and, um, and what that is, is a judgment of feeling, right? So this is an aesthetic judgment uh, as much as, as a moral judgment. Um, okay, and so these are some of the, uh, these are some of the, the um, real world kind of uh, events or, you know, the, the happenings uh, in case conference that got me thinking about this in the first place. Um, but this is all very abstract. So um, one of the questions we want to ask is how do we get at a, uh, a solid um, pragmatic sense of how this plays out like in, in the world? Um, and again, there's more than uh, there's the numerous approaches, more than I'm about to show you here to, uh, to, to get at this. Um, the three ways we might consider doing this are through fields like uh, or through like the, the, the practice of ethnography, philosophy, or history. Um, and so I, I've been thinking about this a lot. And of all these approaches, I think ethnography has to be the best. Right? And so um, in terms of ethnography, what this would mean would be, um, you know, have an anthropologist uh, or maybe a, uh, maybe a sociologist, you know, follow physicians around um, or caregivers around more broadly uh, and try to trace in really minute detail how, how, how caregivers and how their patients identify ethical concerns, uh, right? And so, um, you know, we might think about what kinds of sensations they report, what kinds of structures uh, underpin these sensations, what kinds of tones of voice people use with one another, right? This is all kind of, these are all predecessors to, um, to ethical actions. Um, you know, uh, and, you know, we might also ask how people report feeling in particular encounters. And actually, I'd be very interested to know, and maybe we could talk about this in discussion, you know, what moral distress actually feels like in a clinical setting, right? So we sort of use it as a cue, but what is that? What is it actually, if we were to break it down uh, into phenomena, like what is it actually like? Um, okay, uh, so ethnography would be the best way of doing this. Uh, it's also extremely time consuming. So uh, it's time consuming, it's expensive, uh, and it has, uh, has some serious IRB considerations attached. Um, so again, I'd welcome the chance to do this study with, with anyone here, but uh, could not do it for today. Um, we might also think about philosophy, and this I would uh, defer to, uh, to Dan, but um, this has this, this certainly has the benefit of drawing from a vast body of expertise, right? So people who have thought long and hard, and in some cases for cumulatively hundreds of years about these questions. Um, from what I've read of the medical ethics and aesthetics literature, though, it's, it's fairly thin still. And again, I'd be, um, I'd love to know more about this, but from what I've been able to glean, there's, uh, there's not a lot of work in this, and it tends to be very, uh, very abstract or, or at a way higher level than uh, at least it seems possible for me to synthesize. So um, too little particularity. Um, and then of course there's history, which, you know, as a, as a historian, I tend to historicize every question. And so, um, and so this is, I'm, this is a tendentious way of approaching this, uh, this idea. Um, but history too has pros and cons. And so on the heavy con side, um, you know, historians are not, uh, historians are not very good at telling people what they should do. And so uh, historians are very good at saying, um, well, of course, when something happened and maybe what happened, why it happened and how it turned out, things like this. Um, but they're not very good at saying, at, at sort of predicting the future or saying how people ought to act. Um, and so, uh, and that's just by, by the nature of the field. You know, we study things in the past. And I guess, I mean, I, I guess technically everything we experience is technically in the past, but we study things in the far past. Um, so that's the con side. You know, on the pro side, um, one of the ways that the fusion of ethics and aesthetics shows up most clearly in clinical settings does tend to be in retrospect, right? So um, again, even in case conference, right, we're usually thinking about things that have happened and we're sort of analyzing past events. So there's a strong historical element uh, to case conference. 
Um, and uh, the sort of uh, ethical and aesthetic considerations uh, show up most clearly in moments of controversy. And again, as I said, with ethics, usually uh, our ethical ideas emerge in moments of, um, of controversy or some sort of, uh, some sort of clash. Um, and so controversies in medicine often have ethical and aesthetic roots, and these show up really well in the historical record. Um, and so, of course, this is a, as I said, there's a tendentious reading of why history is the right way to do this, but um, I submit to you that I think it's under the, up to the task. Okay, so let's see, what else do I wanna say about that? Um, all right, so I think that in this case, we'll go on to the case study that, uh, that I have. So one of the best ways to get at this question um, is through uh, this case study that I have, uh, it will be uh, a case study into uh, aesthetics, ethics, and institutions. And again, as I said, it's gonna, we're gonna look at a period of roughly 100 years from the middle of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th century. Um, and this is sort of, this is gonna be a very, um, what historians call a periodization. Um, also, by the way, are we, uh, I could belabor the point of actually what historians do, but a lot of it involves uh, just like sort of reading people's old mail and old texts and stuff like this and um, and trying to understand why why people did the things that they did or why people think the things that they think. Um, and oftentimes this is a very good way, uh, depending on if you pick your sources right, this is a very good way of getting at people's uh, both actions and their mentality, right? So in some ways, very much this fusion of what people are feeling, but also how these feelings make them act um, or how these feelings frame their actions. And so, yeah, and so we'll be looking at these three periods. We'll be looking at uh, the mid 19th century um, and we'll be looking at the sort of uh, aesthetic of uh, gentlemanliness in the clinical setting. Um, we'll then look at the turn of the century in which sort of purity comes to replace gentlemanliness as, um, as a guiding force. Uh, and then we'll look at the mid 20th century, uh, which tends to um, introduce the idea of work, of sort of workman like efficiency, right? So we have gentlemanliness, efficient, um, gentlemanliness, purity and efficiency. Um, so that's, that is, yeah, so that's where we find ourselves. Um, what else do I want to say about that? Oh, the only other thing I want to say is that again, these are not, um, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say that like one aesthetic replaces each other. It's more like a sort of palimpsest where like the, we sort of have layers and layers uh, accumulating. Okay. So uh, one way we could sort of get at this question is um, is by so we'll start in the start in the mid nineteenth century. Um, and one way we could get at this question is by reading texts from the era uh, like this one. So this is uh, D. Uh, Daniel Webster Cathill's physician himself. Um, this is a very common book at the time, um, and it's in fact widely classified as a book on medical ethics. Right? And so. Um, this is, in other words, a, a book by Cathill on how to behave as a physician, like how should be, how should physicians, how should you study, how should you treat your patients, um, and most of all, how should you position yourself to be uh, an effective physician. Um, and one thing we see when we, um, when we read this book is that um, behaving in a manner that is both professional and trustworthy, uh, and that allows one to you know, attain good clinical outcomes um, was not simply a matter of learning or of best practices or implementing knowledge, right? Um, and in fact, the full title of the book is, I'll quote it, it says, is the physician himself and what he should add to his scientific acquirements. Right? Um, again, sorry, I don't have the slide for this, but um, it'd be easier to see. But again, the physician himself and what he should add to his scientific acquirements. And so this is a book saying that it's not enough just to know science, right? It's not enough to have um, well, you, in this period, you might or may not have gone to medical school, but um, it's definitely not enough to have uh, a sci scientific knowledge to be a good physician. You need to add other elements. Um, and among these elements are aesthetic considerations. So uh, that is giving patients a sensation or a feeling that, uh, that you are a good doctor. Um, and one of the ways that someone does this is um, by appearing as a gentleman. Um, and so uh, this might seem superficial, but it was in fact a, a sort of essential part of being a serious doctor. Uh, this is how you prove that uh, in addition to your sort of scientific acquirements, uh, you are also trustworthy, sober, and ethical. Um, so again, appearance is a necessary part of ethics. Um, and so uh, as Cathal says here, this is from the first edition of his text, he says, a physician must take care to be neat in, uh, in personal appearance. Above, above all else, wear a clean shirt and a clean collar. For if you dress well, people will employ you more readily, accord you more, and accord you more confidence, and therefore they will uh, expect a larger bill and will pay it more readily. Um, and so, what we see here is that uh, you have a need to convey gentlemanliness and confidence, and this will redound to your benefit as a physician. 
um, and indeed to the benefit of the field as a whole, right? And so, um, and this of course assumes that a doctor is doing good. Um, assuming that a doctor is doing good, it also means looking good. Um, the reverse, I should say, is also true. Uh, so he says, do not under any plea be a leader of loud or frivolous fashions, as though your starchy foppishness and love of fine clothes had overshadowed all else. He says, discard also glaring neckties, flashy breast pins, loud watch seals, brilliant rings, fancy canes, colognes, perfumes, attitudinizing, and all other peculiarities in your dress. Um, he goes on to say more, but I can skip that part. Um, okay, so in, in other words, don't don't be this person. Uh, so this is a this is a foppish doctor from the 1900s. Um, okay, so uh, and so again, this is a uh, this is self-serving advice in some ways, right? So this is um, this is advice on how to behave as a doctor so that you get paid more and paid more frequently. Um, but it's also one with uh, an ethical underpinning. Um, and the same advice goes for the doctor's office. So uh, here the aesthetic should be one of like learned, learned sobriety. Um, okay. Uh, well, I'll read you a different quote. So this is, uh, so among one of the things he says is that in your doctor's office, you should, uh, again, display no miniature museums of shark's heads, stuffed alligators, tortoise shells, and pale butterflies. No bugs, ships, steamboats, mummies, snakes, fossils, stuffed birds, lizards, crocodiles, beetles, tapeworms, devilfish, ostrich eggs, hornet's nest, or anything else that will advertise you in any other light than that of a physician. Okay, so that's one thing. So don't have a miniature museum like this in your office. Um, he also says, take particular care uh, to avoid making a display of instruments and tools. Keep from sight such inappropriate and repulsive objects as catheters, syringes, stomach pumps, obstetric forceps, splints, trusses, amputating knives, skeletons, grinning skulls, jars of amputated extremities, tumors, mannequins, and the unripe fruits of the uterus. Also avoid such chilling and coarse habits as keeping a vaginal specula or human bones on your desk for paperweights. Um, so in other words, don't be gross. Um, and again, this tells us a few things. So um, first of all, the fact that a text on medical ethics spends uh, a good deal of time on ornamentation, or again, on aesthetic considerations, um, tells us that this is a real concern for physicians at the time, um, particularly for those that wish to make medicine more professional. Uh, second of all, this tells us that there's a particular aesthetic associated with scientific bearing. Right? So it's not enough to know science, right? You, you must also present yourself as a gentleman, present a gentlemanly air. Um, and finally, this tells us something about the ethical concerns of the profession. And this is I think, probably the most important takeaway, um, which is namely that the um, that Cathill and the people that he's writing about are concerned mainly with uh, physicians themselves uh, and less with patient care. Um, and then if we think about, again, Brodsky's, uh, Brodsky's line, um, well, actually he says, uh, oh, I don't have that quote here. Okay, well, we'll go back here. If we think about Brodsky, uh, Brodsky also says that um, every new aesthetic reality makes man's ethical reality more precise. Uh, so the, um, the aesthetic stance of 19th century doctors made their ethical co commitments more obvious um, to us. Um, and so uh, we can see some, and then let's see, we can move on and see some practical consequences of this gentlemanly stance um, in an 1850s controversy over childbed fever or poor apparel fever. Um, so let's see, here we go. So uh, some important background. So in the 19th century, um, a hospital is usually the last place you want to go if you're sick. Uh, if you can go anywhere else uh, and you're sick, if you have anyone, anyone in the world who will take care of you other than um, physicians in a hospital, you would want to go there. Um, uh, hospitals tend to be dark, they tend to be damp, they tend to be uh, cold. They're often run like, uh, like prisons, so people describe being treated more like inmates than, than patients. Um, in the case of Bellevue Hospital, is famous. This is an etching of Bellevue Hospital uh, circa 1888. Uh, so they're often rat infested. Um, in fact, Bellevue Hospital is held out uh, in this period as one of the worst things about New York. Uh, and so one of the worst things about 19th century New York is pretty bad. Um, and they also are known, hospitals are known for having way higher rates of mortality than in the general population. Uh, so there's uh, a whole host of things that are called hospital diseases, including gangrene, including um, septicemia, and including childbed fever. Now, uh, let's see. Oh, okay, uh, that comes in a minute. 
Um, so as we now know, this is in this this is in no small part because uh, of physicians' own behavior. So um, physicians in this period would would uh, think nothing of you know waking up in the morning and uh, dissecting a cadaver along with their medical students. Uh, then they might go amputate a leg. Then they might uh, deliver a baby. Or then they might perform some sort of minor surgery, um, all without changing clothes or especially uh, paying attention to washing their hands. Right. So you can imagine um, they have sort of gore on their hands all day long. Um, and indeed, physicians work mainly in their street clothes. And so uh, these are some examples of drawings of medical students from the period. Um, if there are any medical students in here, uh, you can behold. Um, and so you can see the, you know, here, here he is uh, sort of smoking and he has a, a large mug of beer on top of his anatomy books. Uh, this is an example of someone, again, an example of someone who's dressed like a dandy. So you don't want to be this person, right? This is not a, uh, this is not a sober and reflective individual. Um, I don't know if you can see this also, the, the motto here is we murder to dissect. So again, it gives you a sense of how, uh, of the esteem with which uh, medicine is held in the late 19th century. Um, and so as you're likely aware, some doctors, um, some doctors did attempt to change this, uh, this trend in, uh, in mortality. So um, you've likely heard of Ignat Semmelweis, for instance. So um, in Vienna's large uh, maternity clinic, uh, Semmelweis, made uh, medical students under his supervision uh, wash their hands with chloride of lime. Um, and chloride of lime is kind of like bleach. Uh, interestingly, the reason that he did this is not because, um, not necessarily because of germ theoretical reasons, but um, because it smelled strong, right? And so uh, in a time in which disease was often thought to be conveyed by uh, effluvia or smells, right? Like, like if you could introduce something that smells good, uh, then maybe that will fight disease. So he um, had his students uh, rinse their hands in uh, chloride of lime. And sure, they, sure enough, rates of puerperal fever plummet, right? So they go from something like 33% to 3%. Um, similarly, in uh, 1843, okay, again, this is, not the, uh, this is not the actual Oliver Wendell Holmes quote, and the date is wrong too, that should be 1843. Um, but in uh, 1843, um, the American physician Oliver Wendell Holmes published his piece called uh, The Contagiousness of Puerperal Fever, um, suggesting that the disease is largely iatrogenic. So it's carried by doctors. Um, and again, he recommends that physicians should wash their hands more frequently to uh, stem the tide of this uh, really dangerous disease. Uh, and now, of course, these seem like good, solid common sense measures, right? Um, these are easy to implement uh, and they're easy to see as successful. Uh, but at, at the time, they're incredibly controversial. Um, and this is not because people thought that the science was wrong, particularly, right? So we're on the, we're on the, in the 1840s, 1850s, we're on the cusp of a, of a germ theory of disease. There's still a lot of debate over whether um, disease is caused by, um, you know, it's caused by atmospheres or um, by sort of poisons uh, that may be carried by hands or uh, ferments, right? Um, but it's not, it's not that it's impossible that physician, that, that disease could be uh, transmitted chemically um, in some way. Um, but uh, what people that disagree with uh, Semmelweis and Holmes uh, suggest uh, is that it's offensive to consider that doctors who are gentlemen would be able to carry disease, right? So um, one of, uh, one of uh, Holmes's competitors uh, is a, a man named Charles Meigs, who's a Philadelphia physician. Um, and he publishes a large broadside against uh, Holmes's account of pure apparel fever, uh, saying among other things that a doctor is a gentleman and a gentleman's hands are always clean, right? Um, and so, um, and so, uh, and here again, you know, he, uh, and actually, yes, I have a note here that he also uh, says that uh, Holmes is a lot younger than Meigs at this point. So uh, he sort of Meigs in, indulges in these ad hominem attacks saying that, uh, saying that Holmes is a jejun and physinless young doctor uh, who doesn't understand that, uh, that all doctors are gentlemen. Um, so in other words, it's not possible for a gentleman to carry disease on his hands. Um, and again, in this case, by clean, Meigs doesn't just mean free of dirt, right? He means sort of, um, means more like uh, virtuous, right? Or, um, or, or able or something like this, right? And so um, what Meigs and what the people who think like Meigs believe is that by suggesting that doctors should wash their hands, they're actually undermining the profession. They're saying that all this, all this work that we did to try to look like gentlemen and dress like gentlemen and not keep skulls on our desks and all this stuff is all gonna fall apart if we just go around admitting that uh, we're causing disease by not washing our hands, because that implies that we're dirty. Right, or uh, again, not clean, not gentlemanly. Um, and so again, um, what I wanna say here is that this, that this is an aesthetic quality, right? So gentlemanly cleanliness um, that drives a behavioral concern, right? So how should doctors behave? And in fact, if there's an ethical concern too, like what is the profession to be like, right? So how should we relate to the profession? Um, 
And so again, just to call your attention here, there's not much concern with patients at this point, right? It's mainly concerned with solidifying the profession as, um, as something that is uh, honorable or gentlemanly. Okay, so that's that. So let's uh, smash cut to the turn of the century. Um, as we know, by the late 19th century, so this is, uh, this is the 1800s or 1890s, um, most, although not all physicians, um, had accepted the germ theory of disease, first of all. So hand washing is no longer controversial. Um, and I should also say that um, when germ theory, so germ theory is still controversial up until like the, even past 1910, you could still feel, you could still find people uh, disagreeing with germ theory. But again, it's often on moral grounds and not on scientific grounds. So um, someone like, um, what's a good example? Like someone like Florence Nightingale, for instance, comes out strong against germ theory, um, not because she doesn't think germs are real, but because she thinks that if you start to say that it is um, germs that cause disease rather than people's behaviors, rather than sort of moral corruption or rather than like some notion of filth, then what, what incentive do people have to behave well and to keep themselves clean, right? If it's all just germs and people can run wild and, um, and just blame it on the germs. So very often protests against germ theory were launched on, on moral rather than scientific grounds. Um, in any case, um, with the acceptance of germ theory, um, we also see new aesthetic values arising to, again, not to replace gentlemanliness or some sort of a notion of, of gentlemanly propriety, um, but to sort of complement and supersede them. Um, and so instead of gentlemanliness, the aesthetic value of guiding medicine uh, came to be seen as something like purity. Um, and so purity in this case meant something, again, something different from cleanliness, right? So purity is not the same as being clean. Um, and it's indeed it's something different even than, uh, than gentlemanliness. Uh, it means something more like clarity or transcendence or um, it, it, almost a sort of priestliness, right? And so in, the, in turn, this implies a moral clarity, right? The ability to shed preconceptions, the discipline to see the truth about disease, even though it's difficult. Um, and so, uh, and again, this idea of priestliness um, is, is not my own turn of phrase. Um, many doctors came to see modern medicine uh, and this aesthetic of purity as being something akin to, um, akin to an ecclesiastical sort of, uh, Doctrine. So uh, William Osler, who's sort of considered uh, you know, the father of modern medicine in the United States, um, called this the gospel of the body, right? So this idea of modern medicine is, it preaches the gospel of the body, he says. Um, and if I uh, and if I had uh, sent me to the right slides, what I would have is a great picture of William Osler uh, from the period uh, uh, from 1919. There's a postcard of William Osler as an angel sort of hovering over uh, Johns Hopkins Hospital, chasing out these like germs, which kind of look like spiders or something like this. So try to imagine William Osler, like kind of looks like a William Osler bobblehead doll with wings floating above Johns Hopkins. Um, and so of course, you know, in addition to um, symbolic forms like, uh, like, uh, like Osler as an angel, um, this sort of purity takes other practical forms. So uh, in this period, we see uh, the invention of disposable rubber gloves. We see autoclaves. Uh, we see uh, face masks. Let's see, oops, I don't have the face mask slide here. Um, we see the, and we also see the introduction of, uh, of the white lab coat. So this is, uh, this is Ernst von Bergman, uh, who is accredited as the uh, sort of inventor or the, the person who popularized the white lab coat as a symbol, again, of, of physicians, um, uh, both scientific acumen and uh, purity. Um, moreover, in addition to the white lab coat, uh, we also see the, the white hospital room, uh, the white operating room, uh, and more generally, we see the color white as an aesthetic value that indicates sort of the moral value of scientific purity. Um, and so uh, this is one, uh, this is a patient's account from 1910. Uh, so the patient says uh, in 1910 that, quote, everything in the little hospital room was of spotless white. There's a white tiled floor, white iron chair, white rocker, white bed, small white table, not a microbe to be seen with the best regulated microscope. Um, Let's see, do I have the other quote? Uh, no, okay, so um, a physician of the period also put it that, um, as he said, quote, white, the ancient symbol of purity indicating always a freedom from moral and physical contamination was the obvious choice of color in the development of the hospital. Um, and let's see, and then goes on to say, not only the profession, but the public came to look upon a glazed white surface as the criterion for antisepsis. Um, and so again, here now, notice, um, there's a practical value to making everything in the hospital white. Right? It's, it's hard to disguise dirt on a white surface. Um, but more important is the fact that the public comes to look upon the glazed white surface as, um, as a criterion for purity. Right? And so the other way to think about this is that in, the period, in this period, um, people understood that uh, you could have a 
non-white uh, aseptic or antiseptic surface, right? You didn't have to have, have the color white to avoid germs, uh, but the color white was important for symbolizing a kind of scientific uh, purity. Uh, and so therefore it was essential to practice. Um, let's see. Um, and indeed it was not just, you know, uh, and this was sort of a hospital wide phenomenon. Um, so uh, let's see. And so, yeah, so Ed, again, another, uh, another anonymous physician put it this way. He said, white is a clean color and an all white operating room will lend itself to habits of cleanliness better than any other color because dirt of any kind will obtrude itself to such an extent that the nurses or cleaners will have to remove it, right? Uh, and so uh, again, this is like uh, the ethical, you know, the idea of, of practice of cleaning and practice of keeping cleanliness revolves around uh, this sort of symbolic purity uh, embodied in the color white. Um, let's see, moreover, there's a practical concern. So in addition to being clean, um, moreover, uh, as, the, as this commentator puts it, Boards of directors like to show their beautiful white looking operating rooms. And usually the operating room is one of the show places of the hospital. Um, so in other words, uh, it's not only important to have white because it's a clean surface. Um, it's also important because if you are trying to, to drum up money for your hospital and um, uh, hospitals in this period are almost, uh, almost always underfunded, uh, it's great to have an all white operating room where you could take people, you could take wealthy donors in and say, look, this is our white operating room and it looks pure, it looks scientific. Um, and again, it will, uh, it will guide, uh, it will lead to good clinical outcomes down the road. Um, so in other words, so we see again, the aesthetic value, so the white room uh, overlapping with a moral value of purity, which then has ethical implications, right? So this idea that medicine is a place of truth or an institution that can't be trusted. Um, and again, there's also practical value, right? So we also move from a hospital as being a place that you want to avoid at all costs uh, to a place that you want to go, right? If you are, uh, if you are uh, sick, so people will come to hospitals, people will trust doctors, uh, wealthy donors will invest in, again, we'll have better outcomes for medicine, better outcomes for patients. Um, this brings us finally, I hope, yes, to the mid 20th century. Um, and so this is a period where we see a shift from thinking about purity uh, to thinking about efficiency. And again, efficiency is a practical value, uh, a moral value and an aesthetic value all at once. And so by the middle of the 20th century, we see uh, medicine is on a much firmer footing than, uh, than it was for the past 100 years. Um, for the first time in history, uh, doctors as a profession are becoming trusted by wider publics. Um, biomedicine, so the, um, there, are, there are still controversies by the, uh, by the middle of the 20th century as, as to exactly what kind of medicine is the best. So there's still, still some uh, pushback from uh, homeopathy and osteopathy. Um, but largely biomedicines of the kind of medicine that's practiced today by um, everyone in this room, I believe, uh, is, um, uh, is trusted by what is, is the sort of a standard, right? Uh, any given doctor uh, in any given hospital one or any given practice, uh, one would hope would follow more or less the same practice as any other, um, which if I didn't emphasize it before, that was not the case for much, certainly much of, uh, uh, much of uh, U.S. practice. So up until about 1880, if you wanted to be a doctor in the United States, basically you can just say, I'm a doctor. And if, uh, if someone would come to you for treatment, then, then there's your practice. Um, and your medical school isn't standardized, right? So you, know, you could take as many courses as you want, you can take them out of order, right? So all of this is by the, by the 1920s, all of this has been uh, solidified into sort of a more or less standardized system, uh, which redounds to the prestige of the profession. Um, nevertheless, um, and so, and so, uh, along with this, rather than nevertheless, we see a shift in, um, in aesthetic values. Again, uh, the, the sort of sensory values um, involved with seeing and experiencing the world, um, again, for caregivers and patients alike. And so rather than gentlemanliness uh, in this environment or, or, or priestly purity, um, instead doctors now encourage each other to think of themselves as, as workmen um, and their hospitals as, um, as workplaces. And so this is uh, one doctor from 1927 puts it, um, uh, I can't remember this person's name. Um, all right, the name will come to me, but um, the, as this one doctor puts it in 1927, shop efficiency nowadays takes a great consideration of lighting work and benches and saving of workmen's eyes. Is not the surgeon also a workman? And is not his work about as important as any we can think of? Um, and so, this to me is sort of uh, fascinating. So we pause for a second to consider what we're seeing here. Um, over the course of less than a century, doctors have gone to being 
gentlemen, ideally, right? Like gentlemen with clean hands, um, to sort of priests, right? Who have to embody the sort of white purity, um, to workmen, right? Uh, and to workmen who should have, uh, it is implied, a similar sort of standard of efficiency in their work, right? Or, um, uh, and, you know, similar kind of uh, um, workflow standards, right? Industrial standards. Um, other physicians talk about the, uh, um, uh, about hospitals as uh, as factories for healing. Um, and indeed, again, I wish I had this graphic for you. Um, there's a, uh, there's a, a sort of dramatization of this idea from 1930 in which you see a sort of, again, a shining white pure hospital. So I'm gonna to try to paint a word picture for you rather than the actual picture. Um, you can imagine there's sort of a shining white hospital in the middle where on the left are um, these sort of, uh, you know, the, the unwashed downtrodden masses um, kind of styled as, as immigrants uh, going into the hospital and they're all sort of, they're all dressed in dark clothes. And then they enter the hospital and then on the right, there's a stream of people who are dressed in sort of middle-class like 1930s uh, garb. And so the idea here is that hospitals have become factories for healing, but also factories for acculturating people to kind of modern living, right? And again, this is a um, this is a practical value, but it's wrapped up in uh, in a uh, a sort of a sensation, a feeling. Um, okay, and so thus, when considering surgeons' eyes, uh, again as well as patients' well-being, um, it became clear that uh, even though white was pure, uh, it was not an efficient color, right? Um, and so, uh, the, I mean, in long story short, the glare from glare from white operating rooms is seen as being an uh, impediment to effective surgery, uh, right? It uh, it strains people's eyes. Um, nurses dislike, uh, and they say so uh, quite frequently and, and vociferously, they dislike working in all white environments. It's enervating, people get tired, people get cranky, right? So clearly, even though white is a pure color and even the donors like it, um, it is antithetical to a, uh, to a workmanlike environment. Um, and so, uh, and so as a result, uh, physicians and hospital designers uh, started to experiment. So uh, here, for instance, is the operating room of uh, Harry Sherman, circa, it be circa 1913 or so. Um, and, um, and so Sherman, rather than favoring a black scheme, as is in San Francisco, I think, um, rather than favoring a black scheme, uh, Sherman favored a green, and, uh, a green and red scheme, or a green and gray scheme. Um, because again, because of the discomfort that he experienced optically when doing surgery. Um, let's see, do we have, yes. Um, and so interestingly, uh, the way he justified this is he said, uh, the color scheme again of, of the operating room um, should start from the red color of blood and of the tissues. Uh, and therefore he advises that green, the complementary color of red should be chosen for the color of the floor and the wainscot. I'm oh, sorry, this is 1915, not 1913. Um, and he goes on to say, actually, I mean, I, so how are we on time? I don't want to belabor this point too much. Okay, we've got some time. Um, well, I don't want to belabor this point too much, but he actually goes on to say that the, the exact shade of green that he selects is chemically the same thing as the, um, as the iron and hema, in, as iron and hemoglobin, right? So he's like, he takes the chemical formula of blood and sort of flips it on its head and then uh, turns it into green for his operating room. Um, and so why this is interesting to me is that, um, rather than having uh, the starting point be purity, right? So rather than trying to banish everything that is, uh, that is embodied from the operating room, now he's taking blood and putting it like right back into the very center of, of uh, operating room aesthetics, right? So let's not ignore, let's in fact not, not be like Bernard at all. We're not gonna ignore the blood and we're not going to try to have an all white pure environment or aesthetic environment, right? We're gonna have like blood be front and center, although it will be flipped to be green. Um, and so other physicians similarly, uh, uh, engage this move towards non-white operating rooms. Um, not everyone does spinach green. Some people do uh, red sheets and dark gray walls or gray sheets, uh, lead gray is pretty frequent. Um, all black sometimes happens, although not all that frequently. Um, and the last thing I would say, let's see, do we have, nope. Um, so frustrating, I'm very sorry about the slide situation. Um, suffice to say that uh, while uh, white is seen as enervating to um, to doctors, it's also seen as being uh, bad for patients as well. Um, as, one, uh, as one doctor puts it, uh, white suggests sterility, coldness, and lacks all power to create pleasurable and healthful sensations, right? So here the idea is that um, if you put patients in, a, in an all-white room, it's actually bad for their health, right? Um, it's not only annoying to doctors, but being unable to experience pleasant sensations is bad for healing. Um, and so this doctor goes on to say, um, what if nature had provided 
uh, forest walls of white leaves, her carpets of white grass, her limitless ceiling of white. Oh, God forbid, right? Um, and so as a side note, uh, because we've talked about, uh, we talked about generative AI before in case conference, um, this is my first foray into AI picture making. And again, I don't have it to show you. I tried to get uh, one of like a chat GPT kind of program to make me a, uh, a picture of an all white forest with white trunks and white grass. It would not do it. It's, so apparently it's, it's inconceivable even to the soulless AI that there should be an all white forest. Uh, so this doctor was onto something. Um, and instead, you know, so instead of an all white hospital room, again, this, this doctor notes that uh, the, 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 the patient or the person recovering from uh, sickness, quote, needs the therapeutic reaction of the positive colors. Um, and again, I wish I had this to show you. There's this uh, whole scheme um, in the 19 teens after World War uh, one of experimenting with colors for shell shock treatment, for instance. So um, one common shell shock treatment at the time is to put a patient in an all yellow room, uh, actually a yellow room with a blue ceiling, right? To sort of simulate the soothing colors of nature, right? And again, so again, we see this, uh, an idea that, that aesthesis or aesthetics is useful for um, efficient healing. Um, okay. And so um, I'm gonna just skip ahead a little bit. Um, Right, I guess the point here being that um, we see here an aesthetic value, so a value of feeling um, being converted in this case to a therapeutic value, uh, and in turn the therapeutic value becomes an ethical value. Right? Um, you know, we ought to use more colors in the hospital because it's good for patients, because it's good for physicians, because it's efficient. Um, and so the concern here, I should say, our concern right here is not um, is not whether this is sort of medically or biologically or uh, psychologically correct. Although I'd be interested in your opinions on this. Um, the point is that we have serious people who are considering uh, aesthetic value as a matter of, of medical ethics, right? As a matter of how should doctors or, or hospital designers or administrators uh, behave. Um, and so uh, by the 19, well, this is not very useful, um, but by the 1950s, we see uh, most operating rooms uh, are dominated by these green and blue and sometimes gray schemes. Uh, doctors become more uh, colorful places uh, again, not just in the name of practicality, uh, but in the name of feeling and the pursuit of values like uh, like pleasure and uh, and healthfulness. Um, and so, in 1955, so not this quote, uh, there's a Canadian doctor um, named Wilson uh, who says, again, this is from 1965, one of the most radical changes made in recent years has been the great interest in the use of color in the modern ward. Um, and then he goes on to say, there's no doubting the effect which pastel uh, walls and ceilings have on the well-being of our patients. Um, and so again, this is uh, aesthetics in the service of uh, greater values than just, just sensation or sensual pleasure, right? So we're not making just patients happier uh, or even healthier, but again, we're sort of building greater trust in the institution. Um, okay, and so since the 1970s, this is a, it's actually not from, this is a, uh, I think this is a hospital, uh, an OR in Tehran, I think, actually in the 1970s. Um, uh, this has been a sort of the, the watchword of um, sort of clinical aesthetics. Um, okay, so that that was that's one again really quick. Um, and again, I apologize for the missing slides, but uh, it's a really quick uh, scan through a, a historical approach to um, how we might sort of identify moments of aesthesis in medical ethics. Um, there's a couple of other places we might look. So uh, we were just upstairs. Um, well, okay. So uh, for instance, uh, our own. Um, our own uh, Leon Cass uh, arguing against uh, arguing against the cloning of humans um, has written has an essay called "The Wisdom of Repugnance," uh, and so again we could um, certainly uh, we could uh, take issue with the uh, with the with the the message of the wisdom of Repug uh, of repugnance. But Cass's message is basically that if you feel um, if you feel disgust at something, it is wrong, right? And so uh, in this case, I think he feels disgust at at human cloning, and so then he says. Uh, we ought to we ought to avoid things that uh, that feel bad to us because wrong feeling is a sign of something being ethically amiss. Um, and again, I should say I disagree with with this argument in the paper, but um, but it's it, it, again it serves as a point of evidence that this sort of line of thinking has not gone away. Um, we were uh, we were just talking about eugenics upstairs um, in the 1920s. The eugenics movement uh, gives us another good example about how ethical standards uh, influence medical thinking. So. Um, on the on the left, we have a uh, Jane Davenport uh, is a 
the, the daughter of a famous eugenicist, Charles Davenport. And so in the 1920s, she did a composite sculpture of, of what she calls the average American man. Um, this was displayed at a eugenics conference alongside uh, this, this sculpture by Tate McKenzie of uh, the 50 strongest athletes at, at Harvard. So he sort of mooshed them all into one person. Um, and the conclusion was supposed to be clear for conference goers, right? If uh, like you want, you want the average American man to look like, to look like this, uh, not like this sort of uh, figure with slumping shoulders. He looks slightly apologetic. Um, and yeah, actually, uh, I don't see much wrong with him myself, but um, that could be my own bias as a, as a slight, as a, as a slight uh, person myself. Um, and so again, the point here is that this is a uh, this is an object lesson in um, in what uh, in what uh, people should be like, right? And so it's a it's a um, it's a stance that demands action delivered through aesthetics. Um, let's see. Uh, even thinking about um, even thinking about things like communication. So again, a lot of the times in case conference we talk about um, clarity of communication, right, and about setting uh, uh, setting expectations of people that we communicate with. Um, even that is sort of a an aesthetic value. So clarity is an aesthetic value in um, medical behavior, right? So this is a uh, this is a cartoon from the um, I want to say this is from the 1860s, uh, I think. Yeah, from the 1860s. And so here we have like, uh, this is again, before before you did medical school, before there was rigorous medical school, people would apprentice. Uh, and here you have the apprentice asking uh, asking the, the doctor, if you please, sir, shall I fill up Miss Twaddle's uh, drafts with water? And the practitioner says, dear, 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 Mr. Bumps, how much often much I mention the subject? We never use the term water. We must say aqua distillata, right? Um, and so the idea here is, of course, that to be um, uh, to be a good physician, in this case, he's saying that you have to be unclear, right? You have to uh, mystify your patients. Um, I think we actually take the opposite task attack, you know, in trying to make things clear for uh, clear for people. But again, the point here is that clarity. Um, you might think of clarity as an objective quality, right, or something that could be objectively measured. In fact, it's more of a feeling, or at least the 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 way that we ascertain clarity initially comes to us from a sensation of. Uh, either clarity or obscurity. Um, and so let's see, I think, yeah, okay. So that, I think I've talked long enough. Um, let us, I guess I don't really have, uh, well, I don't have a, yeah, I don't have a good concluding slide. So I guess I'll turn it over to questions or, uh, or discussions. Thanks. Well, I guess what would you say to, so I think, I mean, my, my first reaction is that I would take a more, um, I think I would take a more, I would take a more expansive definition of aesthetics for one thing. I mean, um, possibly not one. And actually, I think that, I don't know, again, you, you would, uh, you'd you be able to, tell, to say this better than I, but uh, it strikes me that someone like, like, again, like someone like Wittgenstein, right, would not say that aesthetics are about beauty necessarily as much as feeling or percepts. If, would you disagree with that? Hmm? Yeah, I'm not sure that. Okay, well then let's then um, you'll have to correct me more at some point. But um, yeah, I don't know. I guess I would say that uh, the, the short of it is I would say that I would want us to expand aesthetics to include more than beauty, so more than like uh, like like things like sensation, right? So again, um, 
And then to your question, like the fop would say, so the fop would say, yes, I'm beautiful and therefore it's good, right? Um, the person regarding the foppish doctor would say, I'm repulsed and therefore it's not good, right? And so um, they would be, so the person arguing against the fop would uh, argue from a position of initial, like, I don't know, stomach churning or revulsion or something like this. Yeah, so I would say, Yes, although I guess in my yes, although in my head I would say that they are, they are distinct because it's more like the uh, the aesthetic would be the initial impulse that allows us to extrapolate a moral position, right? So I, I think I would separate them slightly, although I don't feel I don't feel wedded to this point. And again, and and the reason I would do that is just because um, it's partially for a practical reason. Because again, if uh, if I had the funding and time. And if it was even, I don't even know if this would pass IRB approval, I do think it would be interesting to get at the points at which, like, to, to sort of survey people or to, to observe the, the points at which um, sensations either inform or frame or um, otherwise, uh, otherwise illuminate ethical positions. Uh, so, like I said before, I'd be really interested in knowing, like, what, is, what does moral distress feel like in a clinical setting? Like, you know, I mean, it's it's kind of easy for me to sort of have a I have a sort of nebulous imagination, but yeah, you know, what is that actually, or what is what does mistrust feel like, or what does clarity actually, what does like clinical clarity feel like? Um, you know, proceeding from the idea that um, that these are often ways that we are like at least alerted to the presence of um, an ethical question. So thank you very much. I thought that was really uh, great as well. And um, I have, I guess, a comment, and you know, it, it is really interesting to me the extent to which uh, sort of the the symbolism of how physicians are portrayed, or you know, the use of light and whatnot, that that it, it has some significance. Um, and it, it reminds me of uh, uh, many years ago um, talking with one of the sort of early ethics people in a hospital. And so he was a PhD in philosophy, had gotten his clinical background, had sort of been, been hired by a hospital. And at the time, ethicist was not really the accepted term. And so he said, you know, he wasn't really sure whether he should call himself an ethicist. He said, why well, I shouldn't call myself a philosopher. So he was sort of playing with, well, what's the right term? And he said, well, maybe I should, you know, I'm in, I, I do ethics in a hospital, like a physician. So he said, so, no, like, I'll be the ethician, like the physician. Uh -huh. And so he got a white coat, and, and it said ethician. And so he said, you know, he's very proud of his white coat and went to see a patient because there had been a consult for ethics. And he walked in and said, you know, I am Dr. So-and-so, the ethician. And the patient said, oh my goodness, thank you so much for coming. I was afraid I wouldn't get my hair cut. Because she <laughs> thought he was the beautician. The ethician. Right. And, and it does strike me that there is a, uh, I mean, that the, so, so you're, you're putting uh, aesthetics and ethics together, I thought, uh, had sort of an interesting parallel. It's also, um, it's difficult to research also because uh, aesthetician, like, so like you get a lot of uh, like the ethics of aestheticians and I'm like, right. well, not, and, uh, you know, so like just, you know, um, in, you know, again, in, in, in Googling or in like sort of library searching, yeah, there's a lot about like uh, aesthetic surgery, for instance, which is not, well, actually, I mean, I think I probably actually would be very interesting. Like, I don't feel well equipped enough to delve into it for this, but yeah. Um, it's also so eth ethician. How do you say that? Ethician. Yeah, it, it never caught up. 
Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a hard bunch of syllables for ever <laughs> to pronounce in English. Um, yeah, that is fascinating. Also, I mean, again, just a, a, a good, uh, you know, well, it's funny because actually my, uh, my thought is that uh, my, my, my sort of, again, my gut impulse is that like, gosh, wearing a white coat if you're not a doctor seems a little unethical. Like, you know, like um, a little bit like, you know, I don't know. Um, but anyway, that's, that's again, that's my, my own on, like sort of gut impulse reaction. Thank you. I don't know if you I don't know if you heard about the dramas of the morning. It's been so much fun. I thought they Right. 10.30, I'm like, hey, where are you? 